morning friends today we are privileged to have amongst us a distinguished guest mr art gopalakrishnan who is the executive director of tata sons one of india's largest conglomerates now i request our director mr peter dilema to introduce mr gopalakrishnan to all of us
uh, one of the things I've learned, unfortunately you have to be old to learn these things. Because when you're young, you don't learn it. This is a funny thing about life that all of us go through. Is uh, if anything has turned around, uh, you might have made a small contribution. It's a whole team of people who do it. It's not a single guy who does it. But of course, God has made us in such a way that we like to think I did it. But I'm not falling for that trap. But I thank you for your very kind words. Um, you know, I've got a large number of slides and I've got to clear out at a certain time. So I said, how can I hold the attention of all these uh, trapping youngsters for an hour on a Sunday? So that's the title of the talk, right? No info. <laughs> Uh, that I've got, the man who became a bonsai. How many of you know what's a bonsai? Go ahead, shoot. What's a bonsai? Yes. It's, a, it's a Japanese way of uh, cultivating plants where the plant is grown in small parts. It's a very standard growth of the plant. Uh, you're quite right, the word is a Japanese word. I've given it the title, because this is going to be the title of a book that I'm writing, which will be published sometime in Europe. So from now, I have been struck over my last many years of how managers become a bonsai. You all heard what a plant is a bonsai, right? And so I would like to, I have built a number of stories. And uh, let me tell you what I have on the agenda. Go to the next slide. Go ahead. So first I will tell you how we develop an instinct. What is managerial instinct as different from managerial functions? That. And then got four stories relating to nature and plants and birds and bees and you know crocodiles. Because they are around us, God has made this around us. But we have to make the connection with management. And I've got four stories. The moral of one is how do you build a top class leader? Not the moral, the message. And the second one, the third one is learning by sharing. The fourth one is how to get coached. Nobody coaches you, you get coached. And the fifth one is that it's actually good to be threatened. So, uh, it's very flexible, this is like an UDP restaurant, you can have masala dosa with one vada or uh, idli with two vadas. The combination is entirely flexible. What I will do is to make sure I stop at 10.25, uh, because other I'll be late for the next one. The next slide please. Uh, all of you are first year or second year students? Or a mixture? <laughs> Pardon? PGP 1, PGP 2. So you are mixed. Uh, how many of you have had work experience of the students here? All of you have had work experience. One year, two years, something. Then I think some of you will uh, uh, relate to what I am going to say. Uh, that very often in the management schools I find kids have no work experience. They just come out of their decom in various colleges or wherever and then they're sitting there for a the manager. Do you believe there is anything called a proven manager? No? Why? What's your name? Richa. Richa Mishra. Richa, okay. Why do you think there is nothing called a proven manager? Because it's very really dynamic out there. Every situation is different and um, you have to manage everything but within your Are there proven engineers, proven lawyers? If you say Nani Palkiwala, you say, wow. The only thing you don't have is proven prime minister. <laughs> but they do have people called proven engineers, proven doctors. If you have to have a heart bypass operation, you will say, he's a proven doctor, uske haat se correct? Why is there nothing called a proven manager? Anybody else would like to help me reach out? After all, if you can have a proven lawyer, a proven doctor, a proven engineer, you have a proven man. Yeah. What's your name? Amartya Sen. Amartya Sen. <laughs> wow. uh, management is all about instincts, how you respond to a particular situation. So it can be me every time. So there is no proven theory or uh, protocol that you go through this path. You are put in a situation, you come out of it. Then what is the value of a formal management education? Why are you guys sitting here? Uh, you better be out there <laughs> and developing their instinct. That's, that's basically to develop your gut feeling, how you attack, attack a situation. Right. So there is some value to it. Uh, 
But I have reflected a lot after my many years in this business on these kinds of questions. How do you become a top manager? Why is it you are a successful manager one day and the next day you are down? And you read these, I'm sure you read the, you don't have to go very, uh, find a very fine library, go and read Business Week and you say dump managers and you get a huge dump. <laughs> and a lot of guys who worked in a company 30 years, became chief marketing, chief of finance, then they were given the CEO a job and then something went wrong. Can you think of any such person? CEO of HP. Of HP, Carly Fiorina. Carly now, was she dumb because she was incompetent? No. I thought she's, she's not. She Why do you say it louder? Then everybody can hear and then be kept awake, otherwise, they may go to sleep. They thought that she, she's not being able to align her goals with the, line, uh, with the goals of the company. Okay. Differences with the board, differences on the strategy, and there was a founder, you know, one of the descendants of Mr. Hewlett or Mr. Packard, who felt that this is the wrong way to go, the merger, and so on and so forth. Right. Anybody else? Sunil. Did you put up your hand? No. Sunil. Yes, sir. Coming home, Sunil Alad. He was not a stupid guy. Uh, he was not a uh, bad marketeer. But there were differences with the board. And so that also happened. So you do find lots of people who seem to be successful one day and then they get dumped the other day. And that led me to ask, go to the next slide, please. Managers do make mistakes. We are all humans. We make mistakes in our pursuit of success before success has come to us. As you guys will start doing from next year or year after when you begin your career. You also make stupid mistakes when you're right on top. And we just took some examples. There are a lot of examples of people who make a mistake in the journey. They are not written about in the magazine, so we don't know. But those who reach the top and fall off are written about. And very often, they seem to be very elementary mistakes. Do you have a case study method of pedagogy here? Yes. So when you study a case study, you know, it's so easy to sit down and say, oh, stupid managing director, he should have targeted the market differently, his distribution system should have been, his costing system is off pocket, this company is a write-off. If I were the managing director, I would have done it differently. Right? Don't you do that? Yes. But somebody will be doing a case study when you are running your company. And you may not have the privilege or the lack of privilege of sitting and listening to what other people feel about. So the question I've asked myself is in this green box, is it that managers, and many of them are good MBAs, not from Goa Institute, from Symbiosis, from IIM, they're not uneducated people. Many of them are from Harvard. Who ran Enron down, you know? People from Harvard McKinsey, with very top credentials, I mean, this is not a commentary on Harvard or McKinsey. So how do you reduce the number of mistakes that people make in their career? Go ahead has occupied my mind and I came to a, something which I think most of you will readily agree with. That when the factors are technical in nature, then a prescriptive solution works. I want to improve the productivity of an assembly line. And if I increase the speed of this particular motor and I reduce the speed of the belt, I can get a better match, I'll get a better output. You know, if I do time and motion study and I can do five different things to improve, I can improve productivity. Those are what I call technical solutions. But most of the time, especially as you rise in management, there are strong human factors involved. And there you have to rely on intuition. So I want, there are two words here. One is technical and one is human. And they seem to be almost two different boxes. If you ask Dr. Manmohan Singh, tell me a prescription, Mr. Prime Minister, to get this country, he will produce a very erudite paper. It will be presented in Cambridge, Harvard, he may get a postdoctoral uh, degree as well. Then tell us how to implement it. And on the screen pops up Lalu Prasad Yadav. <laughs> and all his plans go for a six. And managers are rewarded not for thinking of plans or strategizing. Managers are rewarded and recognized for implementing. And therefore, while all the thinking is going on here, the feet and the hands have to work here. This is the Brahmin's work, this is the Sutra's work. But the management institute put so much emphasis on this Brahmin's work that the Sutra's work is genuinely left for somebody else to do. I use the word sudra's work not in a caste sense but in a positive sense that we want doers in Bali. People who go out with a cold face and actually operate. We've got too many thinkers in India. 
So go to the next slide. I have therefore uh, applied my mind in a... Anybody here is a doctor? Because I find management institutes have all sorts of people. Not yet. Go as you have the first doctor. Sorry? We have for part-time program. For part-time program, you're talking. Uh, I don't know if you know how the human brain works because the central point I'm driving at is there are some things that can be taught. I call it management science. I call it technical fashion. You folks are sitting here for two years living in this beautiful campus. I don't know how your rooms are, but the campus is a really nice place. Uh, being taught things. You can teach things which can be taught. Correct? So I can teach you marketing, I can teach you how to do market segmentation, I can do brand positioning, I can teach you how to create winning advertising, I can teach you financial models, I can teach you how to discounted cash flows, net present values. But that's the management science part. But as I showed you on the last chart, a large part of management is management arts. They are human psychology, how will people react to it, how will they overcome opposition. Those cannot be taught. Nobody teaches you that, isn't it? Yeah, they have some lessons called OB, uh, which used to be called BS, which had a double meaning. <laughs> uh, they are trying to give you an insight, but they can't teach you how to do it, right? So if it was that easy, Dr. Manmohan Singh could run this country so well. Even Mr. Pratap Singh Rane could run this Goa so well. But it doesn't work that way. The moment he gets his office, certain other forces come to destabilize. So I said, how do human beings learn what cannot be taught? So what can be taught is easy. And remember, this is the differentiation of a top class manager as compared to an average manager. Those who learn what cannot be taught are the ones who are outstanding managers. Those who learn what can be taught are like everybody. So if you just learn what they taught you in the class in the college, you may get very good marks in your exam, but that's, that's who you are. But if you learn beyond what they taught you in college, then you are rewarded. So this caused me to think of how the human brain structure. And what you see there is a picture of the human brain. Now, what, of course, I have simplified it and not made it technical because neither am I a doctor nor you. You have here, what do you recognize what that is? Mutton, pea. You recognize that, lemon, that's a cabbage. Now, imagine you've taken a pea and on top of that you put a lemon, on top of that you put a cabbage. Suppose you wired them all up, joined them with Alan Knight or whatever. Then you look for an empty khopri. There's plenty lying around. <laughs> Somebody will spare the khopri with lots of empty khopri available. And you stick them into that khopri. And you now created the human brain. The cabbage is sitting on the top. That's why our khopri are the way they are. And your mutter is somewhere deep down there. And this nimbu is in between. Now it's obviously not literally like a mutter or a nimbu. It's just a way of dramatizing it so that you can remember. <coughs> it's a simple way. Indeed, these three parts do exist. They've got technical names which we don't want to go into. Now, this part, the mutter, has a different job compared to the nimbu and compared to the cabbage. In the mutter part, basic life functions are maintained. So here I am standing in front of you. I am expending energy and more blood has to be pumped into my system. My adrenaline has to run. It's the pee that is controlled. Somewhere in the body system, they are saying pump more blood. I am on a treadmill, I am doing my gymnasium. Uh, it's the mutter that's working. You throw a stone at me, I duck. The mutter is working. You know, the basic survival instinct is controlled from the mutter. All creatures have a mutter. We don't think of the lizard as not having a brain. It has a brain. But the lizard's brain has only this. There is no nimbo or cabbage in it. Uh, then, as animals evolved, over the last several million years, the higher species came, pigs, dogs, cats, and they have a nimbu. And in the nimbu, is capable of emotion. Have you ever found an emotional lizard? You see National Geographic magazine, have you seen a crocodile, is it emotional? Because it doesn't have the nimbu. Have you seen a dog with emotion? Almost certainly. If you haven't, then you don't know what's a dog. And they have a lemon. And the lemon is able to 
to some basic emotions. For example, if it likes you, the lemon is what is saying, pyaar se dekho. If it doesn't like you, <laughs> that happens in there. But it can do only simple emotions. It cannot do both. That it hates you, but pretends as though it loves you. That happens in the cabbage. <laughs> this cabbage is leaves and you know lots of layers on it, as you can see, to open a cabbage. This only human beings have. Zarurat se zyada bhuti diya hai. There are advantages, there are disadvantages. So, bottom line, if you take a human brain, any of your people's brain, if you are willing to subject yourself to this experiment, we crack open your skull and we remove uh, the cabbage and the lemon. And we take a lizard, crack open its skull. You cannot tell one mutter from the other mutter. You are nothing but a lizard with something extra, lizard plus plus. <laughs> if you take a pig's brain, you will find both these. You have no cabbage. And I'm afraid the hard news is, however brilliant a manager you are, maybe even the director of the institute, he's not here, so I'll take his name. <laughs> take out his cabbage, he's no different from a pig. <laughs> Sometimes that behavior also shows, not in this director, but some other <laughs> Okay, because nothing more than a laptop. 
in, a, in, in that sort of metaphor. And I today want to focus on two types of bio. You have an instinctive response and an analytical response. And I think you've discussed what is the difference between the two. If I ask you to sit in this classroom and analyze why Tata's are successful or why Tata's are not successful, you would use the analytical, that wiring comes into place and you come to conclusion. If I say now you go and sit in the, all of us can tell the Prime Minister how to do the job better, right? As soon as the budget is out, they will say, journalists will come say, sir, 6 out of 10, 7 out of 10, what is right, what is wrong, and this whole case of both the finance minister has not done this, he has not done that, analytical time. So, if you sit in the chair and sit in the chair, then your instinct comes into play and you find a damn talk to your finance minister or a prime minister or a chief minister. My observation over the many years of management as a subject is that management education, management training, even after you join a company, is all on the analytical type. And nobody trains you in the instinctive type of management. Why? Not because your professors are dumb, but it's damn tough to teach instinctive management. How do you teach instinctive management? So they say, apne aap seek lega, after all, humne bhi apne aap seek lega. So nobody taught me, so they were also learned on their own. And I want to illustrate to you what I mean, if you go to the next slide, between an instinctive and an animal. Do you recognize this animal? <laughs> now, let me ask you an experiment. Imagine you have a platform of this width of this table, okay? From here to the end of that door. And I place this plank of wood on the floor. You are a very hungry person, let's assume. And I put some food at the other end. And uh, there are two platforms, a squirrel is sitting here and a human being on the other. The squirrel likes certain types of food, you like certain types of food, you have made. Both of you are hungry. Do you think both of them will run across and pick up the food at the other end? No? Why? This is not a trick question, by the way. You don't have to be very clever. It's Sunday morning, you know. <laughs> You're damn hungry, you're standing there, there's a plank of wood, you have to run across and get the food. You won't do that? No, 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 no. <laughs> this is the cabbage in action. <laughs> use your butter, for God's sake. Just use your butter. You're damn hungry. Unless you're a, such a staunch non-vegetarian, I don't think you've grown food in the school. All butter paneer and uh, naan has been kept here the other end. You just run across. Right? And this, so will the spirit do it, because he's got a piece of cheese or something at the other. Now, exactly the same experiment, the same level of hunger. I just raise this plank from this level to 100 feet, as high as the old Goa church. Now, will you run across? No. Why? Because you'll be scared of falling down, and you'll have to calculate that if I don't balance myself. Do you think the spirit will run across? He will. Why? Why is he not scared of falling down? One by one. Who? Who's speaking? Yeah, go ahead. Right. The squirrel works on its instinct. Its mutter is saying, run. There's cheese. Or whatever, berries or whatever. And the human being, are both or hair, boots or lagai, and they can get a soul skits of it. Now you may kill the squirrel. <laughs> Which is not... Now, go to the next slide. I therefore say that management, which is a combination of a management science and a management art, has a crucial moment. I call it a crucial moment of performance and I'll tell you in a moment why I say that. Trust your instinctive brain and don't use your top quality brain. Whereas you are taught exactly the opposite in society. So it's almost calm the road. Does any of your parents tell you? The guy so calm the road. Do your professors tell you that? Nobody tells me that. I am being a little uh, provocative in making my statement. Don't follow it literally and cross the road and say the gadi ayah to koi baat de sudha de sa. Don't do those kinds of things. The accident rate in Goa may go up. But I am saying <coughs> management is like a performing art. And in a performing art, there is a magical moment. Performing art can be sports, uh, dance, uh, music. And at that crucial moment, when Shoei Bhakta is coming at me with that red thing in his hand, 140 kilometers an hour, the ball has left his hand. What do you think Tendulkar and Dravid are doing? Calculating the angle of the ball, the trajectory, the velocity, doing out a differential equation and figuring out what to do. They put the bloody cabbage aside, right? 
there's a hell with the cabbage. Go for it. And then Chakamara on the wicket is out. Sorry, can I get rid of this investor and knock it down? Sure, thank you. That's what I mean by a magical moment of performance. When Bala Saraswati is doing Bhattanatya, all those years of training and all are gone. But at that moment she is doing a Abhinaya. It's the emotion that she is able to create out of that Abhinaya. It's a magical moment. That may not be replicated in tomorrow's dance. So, if she's really top class, you'll be able to replicate it time and again. That's what I mean by crucial work. And when you come to a manager, and I take the metaphor of sport or music or dance, we go to work every day in office, in many of you at work. We treat that as a day's work, right? According to me, that's match practice. That's next. Because managers never practice otherwise. You know, if you think of a sportsman, what do you think Rahul Dravid does when he's got a free day? He's six hours at the net, two hours in the gymnasium, another three hours he's watching video clips. I presume that's what he's doing. What do managers do? You go to work every day. You come across problems which are not of that magical nature, of that crucial nature, and you're taking decisions. How much more inventory to order? Should you pay this price to that purchase manager? But then a magical moment comes in your career also, periodically. And you don't know when it is going to come to you because the union has now given you a notice and you're, you're the factory manager, you have to take a decision. You're going to take the union on or not. And if you take the union on, it has certain consequences, sometimes very long-term consequences. You want to launch a product because your competitor has done something, you planned everything. This product probably will work, but not quite there, you know. If you had another six months, you could improve it further. But time is running out. One group is telling you, "Sir, jaldi se launch karo." And other group is saying, "Sir, already or thora bada ke launch karo." Magical moment. You've taken a decision. Press the button. Let's do the capital expenditure and launch this job. If it's a disaster, it's a disaster. If it's great, it's great. In one case, you're written about as a hero. In the other case, you're written about as a zero. That's what I mean by magical moment. So when the magical moment comes. It is natural for human beings to rely not on that cabbage, but on the bee and the lemon. We work with gut and instinct. I want you to, if there's a single message I want to leave with you this morning, it is don't underestimate. When you have to use your cabbage, don't underestimate the power of those two little parts of your tree, which you share with the pig and the lizard. That's what makes that great moment happen. And you don't know which way the moment is going to happen. And the great moment may be a disaster. Or it may be a wonderful day. But you have to take that call. And therefore, I have coined a terminology, if you go to the next slide, please, which I have called the BRIM, Brain's Remote Instinctive Memory. Now, this is what I call an email ID. Okay? There is Richa Brim, uh, Richa at Brim.com. And there is a Gopar at Brim.com, there is a Peter <coughs> at Brim.com. We all have such an ID somewhere in our brain. It doesn't matter that you cannot physically identify. Actually, I don't care because I'm never going to put my fingers in somebody else's hijab and try to find it. Brim. But I know it exists. Why? Because it's a flash bulb memory. You know, at that time, something comes to your mind. You do it. And all of you have experienced it, right? You know it exists. We have in our brain a short term and a long term memory. And all of us recognize that. What do I mean by that? You're busy reading a book or a newspaper. I say, Dad, tell me the telephone number of Mary Auntie. You don't want to be disturbed, but you don't want to be nasty to your daughter. <coughs> Mr. Dilima looks up, oh God, you know, okay, get me my palm pilot you brought. Okay, it's one, two, three, four, five, six for Mary Auntie. Now, don't disturb me, I'm back to the newspaper. Your daughter has gone, rung up Mary Auntie, but got the wrong number. He comes back to you and says, Dad, Sorry, I forgot and I didn't write it down. What is the number of Mary Auntie again? And you can't remember it. You have to get the palm pilot back, right? And you don't have to be 65 or 70 for this. This can happen even at 20. This is called short-term memory. You don't remember things because they don't matter. Then there is long-term memory. The long-term memory is things, I remember my wife's birthday. When I don't, it's going to be very costly for me. <laughs> okay? I remember my kids. Wedding day. I remember I have to have dinner with the boss next week. Long term memory. Most of the time, this is the hard disk on which we are dependent. But there is a third part of your memory, which is the remote memory. 
this stretches deep into some emotional, deeply emotional events that happen. Why do you remember grandmother's cooking? Why do you remember that day when you came back from school and mother wiped the tear from your eye? All of us have such memories. Why do you remember the day, God forbid, your brother died or, you know, traumatic, sometimes positive, your brother got married. You remember these extremely well. And the older you grow, the stronger this memory becomes. That's why this NRI guys who go away to America, at the age of 25, they go saying, I'm conquering the world. At the age of 40, they want to have a go and fish curry all over again. They want to have sambar and idli. They want to replicate in their home the thread ceremony and they will get video and you know CD-ROMs. In fact, to the point that they do it even more religiously than the people sitting here, where the priests are available. Right? All of you have a relation to do these things? Because he's relying on that remote memory. He's harking back. Why do I think so fondly of Calcutta? People say Calcutta is a horrible place. And I was born and raised there. I know every lane, every pada in Calcutta. And for me, that's a memory which is unique to me. And it doesn't matter what somebody else thinks about Calcutta. My memory is frozen in Calcutta of those days. That's why when you go for a family wedding, they say, hey, Richa, itni badi hogi, itni si thi. Okay. <laughs> you know, 15 years ago, Richa, itni si thi. And she has to grow up. Okay. When I meet Shiko, I say, oh, Shiko, you have such lovely black hair. All the girls were chasing me. Remember. <laughs> We've all been through. And we remember those things. And that remote memory is a very important thing, and that remote memory is what. So the brain has a remote and instinctive memory, which I call brain. All of us have this brain. You know it exists, and the reason you know it exists is it operates on its own. You know, uh, explicit memory are things that are facts and events. I taught you this in the college. Uh, three months later, there was a test, and you have to read your books, do your homework in the library, and then. That's explicit memory. Implicit memory is you don't know that you know. You don't know what's... If I tell you to describe your grandmother's cooking, you can't describe it to me. You say, hey, yaar, aisa tha, aisa tha. So nice. So, that's what I mean by the implicit memory. If I ask you, do you know how you ride a bicycle? I think you'll find it very difficult to explain how to ride a bicycle. But you can get on a bicycle and ride it. Most of us. Therefore, I say to you that learning that is deposited at this ID, the brim at richa.com, richa at brim.com, is indestructible. People with Alzheimer's disease have opened their brain and found that that part of the brain has not to do it. The rest of the brain, there might be some sensitivity, but that part of the brain is protected. That's why people with Alzheimer's, even at a very old age, they will remember their village in East Pakistan, because they were born in that village in Dhaka or wherever, you know, all those kinds of memories stay. Therefore, the very valuable part of this cabbage, limbo, and the pea is this email ID called Brim. Now, it's nice to know that the Brim exists. The question is, how do you train the Brim? And that's where I'm going to come to the next part. Go ahead, please. That when you're working at your managing, once you accept that management is really a sort of a performing art, that after all the training has happened, you must get a proper mix of these functional skills or management science as I call it, and these management arts or instinctive skills, and they must be in the right proportion. A very magical thing, I'm very fond of this, I don't know, you people may not have seen it, 1981 or thereabouts. There was a Wimbledon final between Bjorn Bob and Pat McEnroe. And uh, it was a very magical game. It went on to five sets, there was a tiebreaker in the fifth set, and then, uh, back to the one that match. Now just imagine, you know, what is at stake? 500,000 quid, 500,000 pounds, 700,000 pounds, whatever the price was. The whole world is watching this. I don't know, 2 million television viewers. You're standing on the court. It's two sets all, it's five all, six all, and it's a tiebreaker. He serves, you think it's fault, the umpire calls it right. You can become very angry about it. You can accept it very philosophically, like Ramanathan Krishna might have. Or you can argue and get dislocated. Now when you argue with somebody, who gets dislocated? The arguer or the arguee? 
Usually the arguer, the arguer may also get dislocated, but the arguer definitely gets dislocated. It upsets your balance. In the next point, you duff it. And people will say, you know, he lost his food for that one moment that cost him 700,000 pounds and then we will bring him If he had kept his food, he might have won. Nobody can guarantee that, but he might have won. And therefore I say that <coughs> delivery in the right proportion and that crucial performance. You cannot just take it lying down, you cannot overreact to it, but somehow there is a magical mix of what happens in that time, which comes. Go to the next one. How many of you read this book? Many of you, many of you. Fascinating book, right? Do you remember, there was a sequence in this book when uh, Sophia knew, I think that's her name, and uh, Robert Landon, isn't that his name? Uh, they were in the uh, church, uh, and they found the script. And uh, they had to say, how do you open the script? Well, you got 26 alphabets on each of these, and one, two, three, four, five, six of them. And the question is, how do you open the script? It's like a combination of and he says, Sophie, we can't open it. If I remember my arithmetic right, there are 26 ways to the power 5 possibilities. And that's 12 million possibilities. How do you open the script? Do you remember that? Sorry. If you don't, uh, you can relate with the, the, the story if you read it. And that sends them on a wild goose chase uh, through the rest of the book. Rest of the book. Now, this is the carriage. This is the whole copy that we have. Because our mind is a bit like that script. If you go to the next slide, it's like a combination law. And in the combination lock, if I give you a combination lock and I say, I have forgotten the code of this, please open it. It's a three digit one. You start at 000 and go up to 999. And you get an aha feeling at one of those numbers if you open, right? Now suppose it had 26 digits. If you start at 000, go up to 9999, it will take you a lifetime to On top of that, if I tell you that the code number of this changes every two hours, depending on where the sun is in the sky. Then you say, hey, apne, apne bas ka kaam nahi. Now this is what we have got inside our copies. This cabbage that we have is a combination lock with 26 digits, which every two hours changes its mind. And it's that tough to know how to open this combination lock. And therefore, you cannot follow the analytical method, the management science method of starting at 0000 and going up to 99999. You have to do it by gut feel, instinct, intuition. And if you keep playing with it, over a period of time, you may start to see patterns. In physics, we have a subject called chaos theory. And some of you may remember this if you studied physics. <laughs> what is chaos theory? Chaos theory says there is a randomness about this event happening, but there is a pattern to it. And if I study the pattern, I might be able to predict the random. That's the principle of chaos theory. And therefore, the management mind also and I'm going to restrict myself to management because that's what we're speaking about. We can extend this to anything in life. Okay? But let's keep it to management. Let's I sound like Swami Rangana Ananda or somebody. I don't know if you lecture about the video life. Uh, we are constantly looking for an aha. If I'm the CEO of your company, I want to appeal to you to increase productivity. I give you all a talk. Say, you know, this is the facts of the company. This is the manas per ton. And this is the cost per man hour, so we are uncompetitive and somebody is better than us. This is the rational, analytical, <coughs> cabbage part of the stuff. I am trying to motivate you to improve the productivity of the shop floor. When you walk out of that room, you may say, yeah, the boss ka kaam hai, apne to kya karne Next time you know, sit me dekh If it is that easy to persuade everybody, Dr. Manmohan Singh can call Ram Vilas Paswan, <laughs> Lalu Prasad Yadav, and sit them down and have a conversation, analytically show that our fiscal deficit is too high and everybody should follow the path. It doesn't happen that way. Why? Partly politics and all that stuff, but leaving that aside, the same message doesn't transmit into your mind the same way for everyone. Your combination lock may get open, but not yours. When I tell you any set of facts. And therefore the question management is constantly for a leader fiddling around and trying to open your combination lock. And until I open everybody's combination lock, I don't have a team to transform my company, to make the provide of management the best in Western India, whatever, you know, whatever your ambitions be. I therefore say to you, especially because you folks are about to begin your career, a lot of people are cynical. They don't read management books, they don't read management magazines. 
they don't attend management seminars, they are a pretty waste of time. First five, ten years you attend. It is true, many of them are a waste of time. But the trouble is you don't know which one is a waste of time. You are having live on the series. Some lectures will be a bit like that, you know. <laughs> Not worth a Sunday morning. Some lectures will be energized. But if you say, after attending the first two, three, four, here I will the series is not for me, I'll skip. You may miss a magical moment when you get an aha feeling in your mind. And it is for the quest of that magical moment that we spend our lives. All greatly created things are highly unproductive. The act of reproduction in nature is highly unproductive in human beings or in animals or anything. The act of creativity, a painter, a musician who is composing new music, they are unproductive. You can't calculate the man hours, how long, how many man hours did Da Vinci spend making the Sistine Chapel. Nobody is calculating that. So, in management also, that aha moment is very important. And I say to you, immerse yourself in whatever field you have chosen. If you meet Sunil Gavaskar, it is difficult to have a conversation other than cricket. I mean, he is a broad address to Sunil Gavaskar as a name, but I don't please interpret Sunil Gavaskar. If you meet a cricketer, the other day there was some dinner in Bombay, all these filmy people came. And uh, I found myself at a table where uh, Sri Devi and Nara Dutta, I didn't know what to talk to them about. And they must have thought the same of me. Uh, it sounds very nice here. I had dinner with uh, Sri Devi and Nara Dutta and Aishwarya Rai. And my wife was with me by the way. <laughs> uh, but, you know, after saying, I, I saw your film, I forgot the name, which film is it? Is my short term memory. <laughs> what are you talking about? Each one is immersed in their own area. You have to immerse yourself in management. Listen to the emotion and the stories and things that make management work. And then only you become a top class manager. Go to the next slide. And therefore, I am a great believer in storytelling. You know, in management, you say, it is not a very good sign. But I am saying, in a constructive way, kahani sunana ya achiba. You should do that. Because that's how you learn all these stories. You go to Bengal, there are jatra. Jatra goes from village to village. It's telling them stories of good character, morality, courage. And uh, you go to south, you'll have Upanyasam, Harikatha. I'm sure they are equal to Goa. You know, we all have, uh, everywhere in the world, uh, storytelling as a method, and that's why you remember these things, what you were told about Ramayana or Mahabharata, you know, anything. These go into your brim because they are full of emotion. So think of stories that have an emotional content. And you can squeeze it out like water comes from a wet sponge. And that's sitting in your brim. And at a magical moment, that email ID is squeezed. And those juices start to flow. And they determine. So, God forbid, if one of us is walking on the road and there's an accident, and there's a child on the road with its hands knocked out, and the emotion comes to you. You're not using your analytical brain. And based on that, some people will run away. Some people say, if a police case over, to hum police mein jana chahiye, kame that works. Some people will say, Bachi mar rahi hai. let's go and do something. And each of them has squeezed out something different from the brim. And they respond. So, go to the next slide. I have found that in the last 10 years, I must find ways to tell stories in management. And it's a big part of my job I have found in the last 15 years when I've been running a company. That you have to tell stories to your people. That's what makes them... He referred to Tata Motors or Rallies, another company which I'm chairman of. Ran a loss. One so brought the loss in. You know, it looks like a hopeless basket case. You can't do anything. I want to close loss. What are you going to tell people? Yes, you analyze your numbers, you show them why your working capital went out of control, why the sales collapsed. But at the end of the day, you have to do something about it. You have to appeal to their sense that Tata Motors turned around. Not because I did anything. But people in Tata Motors are very proud people. is they were right with emotion. All I had to do was to, you know, tickle that, their brim. And say, yeah, zindagi mein kabhi pote ke saath bed ki kuch kahani sunana hai, humne bhi Tata Motors mein, you know, I worked at it. 
come on, that's all. And there were 20,000 brims which were brimming with it. It all worked. Uh, Somebody is called the CEO or director and he may take the credit or other people may give him the credit. But he knows deep in his heart that he engaged their emotions and the key to their hearts is the story. And so we need to do this all the time. And I found what kind of, can I go to the next slide? Where can I get stories from? And I found this in animals and nature. And why did I think of animals and nature? A number of reasons. I don't want to go into all the stories of why I chose it. But you all watch National Geographic magazine? <laughs> Discovery. It doesn't matter what your age is. Young, old, grandfather. It creates a sense of awe in you, right? It always inspires. Even if you watch for 15 minutes. Because this nature, this world, God has made is fascinating. To see how that chick does, chasing that bird. See how the crocodile opens his eyes, eats up. You see a snake which opens his mouth and they show you the whole bloody animal going through the body of the snake. All this creates sometimes fear, sometimes repelling, sometimes attractive. So animals do create a great deal of emotion in us, not just the dog you have in your house. And so about 10 years ago, go to the next slide, I started to look at various animal stories which have now put into these categories, learning and growth, how to transform an organization, how to create team working and make people cooperate, motivate them to cooperate. And each of them have got some animal as you can see. Uh, pigeons, and monkeys, turtles, <coughs> flies, all sorts of things. And I started doing this initially internally within Tata, because I'm sometimes called upon to talk at a training center and all India Management Association. And uh, I found that people were very engaged. People wanted to listen to these stories. People found it. In fact, sometimes I met people after three years. If I remember the story you told me about something or the other. And I said, if this can create a certain amount of emotion and there's a connection with management, maybe for some people, some story may enter some part of their brain. And uh, if that does, then it's a very small way in which uh, managers can improve their film. So what I'm, what I'm going to do today, what I've got today, I've finished explaining this part, how the leader's instinct developed, the value of storytelling and anecdotes, how do we learn what is not taught. You learn character and humility and courage in a certain way. <coughs> is there the management arts you can learn in the same way? That's the issue. Today I've got four stories. The bonsai, the blue tape, the falcon and the snake. And uh, I have not brought all of these because obviously there won't be time. But uh, given that it's 5 past 10, probably I can do one or maximum two stories. I can give you a choice or shall I just run through the bonsai? Since you don't know what's in it, you can't choose, huh? Avoid the bonsai Do the bonsai. So go to the next slide. See, I have programmed your cabbage to now respond to me. <laughs> My basic thesis here is that nobody sets out to become a bonsai manager. But the world is full of bonsai managers. And you people are young people. I want to tell you how to avoid becoming a bonsai manager. How you should think about your life and your career. Because there's one story about a bonsai. Once you're a bonsai, you're a bonsai. Go to the next slide. Here's a very lovely animal. All of you recognize it? Maybe you should go to the next slide. You recognize it? Emotion? Any pee, mutter? Or pure pee, right? You never seen uh, a crocodile which is very emotional. Go to the next slide, please. Ah, uh, there. Somehow this crocodile gives you that pee feeling, right? I tell you, I'm a vegetarian, so is my wife. And there was a Unilever conference about 15 uh, years ago. And they took us to the Zambezi River in uh, Zimbabwe and it's a big river, <laughs> the crocodile is everywhere, or supposedly, okay. And so they have a crocodile farm on the banks and it's a cute sort of tourist thing to take. So we all got off, we had left at 6 in the morning, they had, had no breakfast because they said it was go early, I think uh, for whatever reason. And then they took us to this crocodile farm. And the crocodile farm, there are all these little things, you know, baby little crocodile, and how they grow them and so on and so on. 
I think even if you're a non-vegetarian, it's not a very nice sight. If you're a vegetarian, it's a terrible sight. And when you're very hungry, you cannot do what the squirrel does. <laughs> so it became a bit difficult. Uh, but that increased my interest in crocodiles. And uh, my wife said, I hope you get something vegetarian for breakfast. Because in Africa, as you know, everything is meat. I said, listen, they give us at least some bread. Don't worry. Anyway, the breakfast came and one by one it all opened out. And there was fish and meat and chicken and God knows what else. And my wife quite likes her breakfast, you know. And I quite like my wife. So we all <laughs> a lot of interest in this breakfast. Which was... Finally, I said, don't worry, get bread and butter. Finally, the bread came out. It had been baked in the shape of a crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> my wife said, I could eat this. I said, it's just bread, you know, forget about the fact that she says, no. He's looking at her like this. <laughs> she said, now I skip breakfast, you know. So I took a lot of interest in crocodiles. And uh, read a report in the Nature magazine, which said that if I take two crocodiles from the same parents, okay, brother and sister or brother and brother or whatever, put one into a pond, which is the size of this room, and one into the ocean, will they grow to very different sizes? To the extent of their own genetics, they may grow slightly different. <coughs> what do you think? You. Yeah, you look like a crocodile expert. <laughs> Much smaller? Not really, but compared to this one. Maybe half the size. <laughs> Take a guess. Four fifths. Four fifths. You make an outstanding manager because you're bullshitting all the way. <laughs> <laughs> you have a very good career ahead of you. You don't have a clue what the answer is. But all the way up, I'll make a Okay. Listen. When you have to use your cabbage, use it. <laughs> don't throw it away. If I take twins born to the same parents, raise one son in a one-room chawl in Bhivandi and the other one in a farmhouse in Gurgaon, will one be 85% of the other or four-fifths, you said, 85%? Do <laughs> you think one will be so big, one will be that big? <laughs> they may be one, two, three, four inches shorter or bigger depending on the gene distribution, but that's about it, right? Why would the crocodile be different? But the crocodile is And the factor is one to four. The one in this room will be one meter long. And the other one can be four meters long. <coughs> Maybe one to three, but it's not a few inches here and there. And I got very interested in this. So why does this happen? And uh, there are a number of reasons in biology, which is not my subject, so I don't want to go into that. But it turns out that the one who's in this pond has a limited horizon a limited number of things to do, a limited number of things to eat, and limited number of challenges, and he grows to one meter. And the other guy is constantly looking around, who's going to eat me, what can I eat? He's swimming strongly against currents in the ocean. He's being challenged all the time. His whole body and biology is working for growth. Because if he's big and strong, people won't mess around with me. This fellow says there's nobody who can mess around with me. And he grows to one meter, the other guy goes to four meters. And this is why it doesn't happen to the baby in Vivanti versus the baby in Gurgaon. Because one assumes that they are both living in homes where they are given whatever nutrition or food they are supposed to get. So I asked my friend Vidhu Sagar, whom all of you have heard of, because he's a na nature guy. I said, does this sound sensible? He says, impossible. And he's a specialist. So we sent an email to Madras Crocodile Farm, which is a big crocodile farm. And Ron Whitaker wrote back and said, absolutely. In fact, they are called bonsai crocodiles. So bonsai is not only plants, it's called bonsai. So I said, why would you want to have a bonsai crocodile? He said, you know, if you're a very wealthy, rich person living in Florida, your guests have come, you get a glass of wine, you want to take them to your compound, there are little ponds there. It's nice to have a little one meter crocodile. You have a four meter crocodile, your guests don't want to go out to the pond anyway. <laughs> the one meter crocodile, they all can stand and, you know, say, how cute. <laughs> what do you say to a one meter crocodile anyway? Uh, so they grow bonsai crocodiles. Go 
to the next one. Now, bonsai plant, our young friend here has already discovered. What's your name? Sachin. Sachin. Uh, he has already, do you know how they make bonsai plants? Sorry? Yeah, so they tie up the roots, they prevent its growth, they curb it, and then it stays. So you get an oak tree which is that high, and then it can stay in your drawing room forever. Now you take this oak tree and put him back into the forest. He won't become a big oak tree. So both the crocodile story and the plant story are telling you that it is possible to constrain growth voluntarily inadvertently or deliberately. And you also have tap roots, you also have branches and shoots when you develop your management career. And you are going to be constraining it yourself. And if you remain a bonsai manager by the age of 30, I'm afraid it's difficult to make you grow after that. The first eight years or ten years of your career are extremely important. Swim in the wide ocean. I'm not saying need a wild life, I'm just saying swim in the wild ocean. Where you are challenged, where the kind of work you do is teaching you things, and if you got the wrong job, <coughs> paying you $150,000 to live in Rai Bandar, you may not be gave you such a job at all. Um, don't take it, it's not worth the money. Because at the age of 30, you will have become a bonsai man. And the world is full of bonsai man. They come for EMBA on Sundays and Mondays, it can help that much, but no more. Sorry, I don't mean to run about your EMBA program. <laughs> there are some students of EMBA somewhere around. But uh, all I'm saying is the first 10 years are extremely important. <coughs> Choose your career with care. So, <coughs> I was very struck. I had thought of a bonsai plant, I then thought of a bonsai crocodile. Uh, take the next slide, please. This is a scene from uh, Bengal. You know, the Bengalis love fish. Any Bengalis here? Three or four? Well, you recognize what's Katla fish, I'm sure. Uh, in the Sundarbans, I came across an experiment at the day. You know, the image of Bengal is a bit like Goa. Laid back, relaxed, fish coming from the pukur, and life is sort of, you sing Robindra Shwami, you spend your life, and, you know, that's a sort of imagery, which is not entirely true. In the Sundarbans, the Ramakrishna Mission at Neem Peet has done an experiment, and they wanted to teach farmers how to get more crops. Now, they, what, what is the pattern? I'm just going back 30 years in a particular area. The pattern was that the katla fish would come, you catch it in the river. And the rains would come, July, August, September, and you grow paddy. You've got a crop of paddy, and that's it. You know, paddy in the house, fish is there. You put paddy and fish, you're okay. No other crop. How do you increase the income of the farm? So, this is what they did. The Ramakrishna Mission actually demonstrated this to the farmers. They said, listen, if you got one acre or five acres of land on, dig out 20%, make a kuku there, make a hole there, let the rainwater accumulate there. You grow paddy only on the rest of the four feet. Because you have turned the topsoil, you are actually able to get the same level of production. The productivity improved. Sort of 80% of the land, you got 100% of the production. So your paddy was fully protected. And in this puku, you put these little katla fries. And the katla fries are now growing up. And when the rains come, the water rises and it overflows. And the katla fish can go out. They have now a much wider area in which to swim. And they grew three times faster. I got all the statistics, but I'm not going to go into that. They grew three times faster. So you could get bigger katla in one third the time compared to they're growing naturally. So the reverse also is true, that when you increase the span of what your body or mind has to do, you can grow faster. So there are two messages. One is, you can constrain your growth. The second is, you can accelerate your growth. I'm telling you the Katla story to show how you can accelerate, and the bonsai story to tell you how you can decelerate out. Constrain. Go to the next slide, please. <coughs> and in the case of managers, your growth is influenced by your mental food. What you read, this lovely library you have, I hope you use it. It doesn't matter that you can't remember everything you read in that library. That's really not the point. But please exercise yourself. Get charged up with the things that you don't understand. Feel good and reflect upon the things that you do understand. This is meant to be immersive. That's what this library is here for. And not only this library, any other place that you get. You have to 
expand your experiential space. Go out and do something which teaches you and avoid this getting stunted because you don't have a really poor challenge. You know, I've seen young people, my, my children have friends uh, who are working in America, come out of Wharton, $160,000 job, 28 years of age, living in New York. It sounds very sexy when they come here. They will also make it sound very sexy. They put on a little accent and they do a few things about life in Manhattan that will make your eyeballs become very big. But actually, what the hell is he doing there? He's doing in front of a computer and punching some financial models, right? And uh, working from uh, 11 in the night. You ask him, when was the last time you went to exercise your body? He says, I don't get time. When was the last time you read a book? He says, I've got a lot of books which I intend to read. <laughs> Did you read any magazines? He says, uh, uh, occasionally I see the Harvard Business Review or Time Magazine or Harper's Bazaar. Okay. He said, what about the newspaper this morning? Oh, newspaper, there's no time, but 10 minutes I was on the treadmill, I watched the television. That's the mental food. $160,000. You're heading straight to be a bonsai. I'm not saying you should read every newspaper or every magazine. But for God's sake, calibrate and make sure that you're doing this last thing here. The successful managers uh, are actually looking for challenges, looking for things that disrupt, looking for things that can... And I don't want to tell you about uh, Hindustan Lever and so on, but Shiko knows. I joined the computer department. And they said, uh, I, I had this vision, you know, I'd be wearing a tie. In those days, if you had an air conditioned room, it's not like today, everybody has an air conditioner. You, you know, you're the chairman. Everybody else had to be sitting under the tall ceiling fan. And I said, I'll be in an air conditioned room. Why? Not because I was a great guy, but the computer I had to punch was a great guy. <laughs> and everybody would be sweating outside, and I'll be sitting inside pressing all these big disk drives and paper drives we had in those and they gave me a ticket and said, you go to nursing. I said, what for? They said, go and sell Dada and Life Boy So. I said, but I'm a computer engineer. Why should I sell Dada and Life Boy So? They didn't tell me this. But they said, you better learn how it's done. What do you want to computer if you can't feel for the emotion? And I was 21. And I said, bloody hell, the emotion of the salesman. Damn it, I'm an IIT Kharagpur, you know, great guy. But I must say, that. After some years, I realized it's probably the best thing that ever happened. But my first one year was quite miserable. And this was the same thing in the factory. People like Mr. Dilima sat in front of a pan room, which was hot and sweaty, with some, what's his name, Fernandez or whatever that guy's name. Yeah, he would say, the way to tell a good soap is put it on the tip of your tongue. <laughs> and that's it. If you haven't got the right taste, you haven't learned how to saponify. And so that's how. Next slide. And we should give up, and you should give up, your generation should give up this principle that, you know, seniority. You know, you meet people, they say, Sir, are you promoted in? Uh, I'm 51, he's only 46. Only as a little baby, you know. <laughs> I say, but how that does it matter, you know? He's done well. Say, I've also done very well. And then you say, I was senior to him in the Rai Bandar Engineering College. In 1972, I graduated, he graduated in 1976. I've had this conversation with guys. And I don't care. It was the Raipandar Engineering College in 1972. You know, that's, that's like saying Swami Vivekananda, something happened. I'm not interested. You have to look for tomorrow. And the guy says, seniority you should not ignore, sir. You know, pointing his finger at you. Even in the IAS, this is the logic given to me. Even after 35 years of service, they look at which batch you belong to. And within that batch, what rank you got in the entrance exam when you were 21 years old. That will determine when you become the chief secretary at the age of 59. So I said, bollocks, you know. That's fine for the IAS, but that's the way they do it. But that's not the way this company is going to run. We can't work that way. So we come with this mindset that seniority is very important. And we live in a social system. Be very respectful to all your seniors. But just because they are your director or your teachers, doesn't make them wiser than you. In fact, the quality of a great director and a great teacher is that he'll produce a generation which is wiser than them. Otherwise, they have failed. I hope I'm right. My grandfather had a very much different life from my father. I'm, true, I'm sure it's true for your, children, uh, your grandfather as well. And your father had a better life, and you had a better life than your father. And you're all working here and studying here so that your sons and daughters will have better lives than you. And therefore, that type of succession planning where each generation becomes better, 
is what we are all about. It's not all about seniority. And please go out and look for this very broad exposure across functions in multiple geographies. Look for transfers. Don't look for people uh, who say, I've got my house in Goa, I'm an old mother to look after, and I have two sisters to marry off. I don't want to move out of Panjim area, but I want to be the chairman of the company in 30 years' time. All that is not possible. If you have responsibilities, we understand, and then you cannot be the chairman of the company. And please look after your mother and your sisters. Nothing wrong with it. At the end of the day, we have to make these calls. But please get out into the real world, uh, and if that means getting transferred 10 times, you can transfer 10 times. So let me close with this last chart, I think. Go to the next one. And then I have run out of my time. This is what my experience have taught to me. That the challenges into which... Yeah, hang on, hang on, hang on. You're on. Internet. <laughs> Go back. Uh, the challenges into which managers can be sent, that can be experienced in the workplace or even personal. It is the challenge that you should look for. Not the comfort. In fact, it's almost... Almost, if I may say so, if it's comfortable, maybe it's not challenging. The moment you reach a level of comfort, I remember in Hindustan, if you always told, in four years you learned how to be an area sales manager. You become comfortable, you know the distributors, you know the system, you know the products. Destabilize them, go out and do something else. And that means you get transferred, you have difficulties. But either you go to a different product division in the same area, or you go to a different area with the same product division. But destabilize. Turn the soil over. That improves productivity. You're sitting in the same soil all the time, doing nothing different. Well, I'm afraid there's nothing wrong with that, but don't try to then become a top class manager. Second, if you now go to the next, this is a very lovely quotation of Aldous Huxley. The experience is not what you have done, but the experience is what you have done with whatever happens to you. People say, I've had 25 years' experience in accounting. He's entering the same vouchers. For 25 years. And that's not 25 years of experience. Experience is when something unusual has happened, how you react to that. The trial balance didn't match. You sat up all night in the old days, nowadays everything is done on the computer. You actually sat all night trying to go entry by entry, and that taught you a lot. It taught you the value of right coding, right way of writing accounts books. And an engineer who sat up in the night because somebody got injured on the production line, made sure that his family was taken care of. That makes a human being out of you. And those are worth a lot. That's why you'll find Mrs. Gandhi was very good at this. If there's a calamity somewhere, she would be there immediately. People may say that's a politician, etc. But she would be there, and politicians love to be seen. You know, they go to the hospital, they fix the cheeks of somebody, they put their hands on them. Part of it may be Lakhna. But it's an important part of saying when a calamity has happened, why did Prime Minister Manmohan Singh go to jail? Why did he go to the hospital? Why was he put alone? There may be a bit of public relation that Lakhra is. At least in the case of Dr. Manmohan Singh, he's a very genuine sort of person, most of us know. And these are ways in which you're dealing with people who have had a traumatic experience or a good experience. Next slide. Uh, there are many, many commonplace experiences that come to you on a day-to-day -day basis. Grab it. When I was told to fill up a salesman's daily report, this is such a boring piece of paper. Uh, it had sunlight, life boy, something, something grim. And I had to say, I went to Kaksina Topi Kamate in Punjab. And I sold him five boxes of life boy, three boxes, and nil. But out of those, I learned how is a sales system built up. How is the control system built up? Who is Kaksina Topi Kamate? I don't know if he still exists. Kaksina Topi Kamate, I suppose that's the real name. But in those days, it was written as Kaksina Topi Kamate in Goa. And uh, you, you learn to sort of uh, write down all this stuff. But you learn that if you're doing that for the next 25 years, to say I've had 25 years of experience doesn't make that perfect sense. Next one. If you cannot do what you ask your men to do, you cannot experience the pains and the pangs in their workplace, you cannot develop empathy for them. That's not my quotation, it came from the general of the army. I think you'll understand. And the last one. In your first 10 years, please look for grassroots experience. Things that really stretch you. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're a doctor or a professor or a, a manager, in each of those, those are available. 
And those are the ones that create great management. Avoid becoming a bonsai. Thank you very much. It's 10.28. I've covered only one story. But uh, thank you for the pleasure of uh, missing church to the Catholics and uh, being here and listening to me. I hope it was at least a modest interest. Thanks, Chico. students and faculty of our institute, I thank Mr. Gopalakrishnan who was kind enough to take time out of his busy schedule to be with us today. I thank you sir for your inputs on the importance of our cabbage, analytical mind and importance of our mutton, our instinctive mind. Thank you for pointing out to us the importance of expanding our knowledge and also our experiences. And now I request Mr. Gopalakrishnan to accept a small momento from us spoken on our decision. Hey, it's not necessary. Okay, anyway, thank you.